I generally find it very problematic for this current generation, and I'm not talking about young people, I'm talking about all of the people in this day and age, to look back on previous generations and criticize them, okay? I think that it is generally inappropriate to apply our mores, our particular um, feelings of the day to people who lived hundreds, if not thousands of years before us, right? I think it's pretty vain to stand on a foundation which others made and complain about how they made it. That being said, every now and then, there's something that a group in the past has done that is just, you know, you can, you got to say it's just wrong, okay? And I'm going to do a little of that today, all right? Now, for those of you who, who haven't been here in a while, we are in week three of our teaching series, our preaching series on uh, living in the Holy Spirit. So today we're going to talk about tongues and prophecies. And I want to start off by talking about this incredible event that happened over 100 years ago. It was 1906 out in California. There was a little church on a street in Los Angeles, and the street was Azusa. It was Azusa Street. Some of you may have heard of this. It's regarded as the birthplace of the modern charismatic revival. And uh, it was a little church, small room, and the Holy Spirit fell there one time in a worship service, and it just sparked a revival that lasts and has impacted people even to this day. Right? Praise God. They did incredible things. They really heard the Lord, and they were so on fire by the Holy Spirit that that fire caught. And it moved not just from this little church in the middle of nowhere. Well, it wasn't middle of nowhere. It was Los Angeles. But it was, a, it was not a good neighborhood of Los Angeles. And that spread into Catholic churches, Episcopal churches. The Assemblies of God had practically formed these movements, right? And so this was an incredibly powerful thing. But there was one thing that I think they really messed up on. And that was one of their like original doctrines was that you had to be uh, born again. You had to give your life over to Christ. Yes, completely agree with that. But they said that when you did so, you would speak in tongues. And that was evidence of your salvation, right? And I want you to get that. They said that you couldn't just say a prayer, call out to Jesus, and be saved. The evidence of your salvation was that you spoke in tongues, okay? And I have seen this played out in other churches with people who have come here who have had basically church trauma because they went up for prayer, they went up to give their life over to the Lord, they did so, and then somebody said, okay, now speak in tongues. And if you don't, it didn't work, you're not saved. Okay? So this is a deeply troublesome error. Okay? It's led to a lot of people being wounded. And I, I can sit in there, and even though I don't like criticizing previous generations, this was a mistake. Okay? But it's not hard to understand why. Okay? Because the church in Corinth had the same problem. Okay? When St. Paul, probably from Ephesus, wrote his letter, his first letter to the Corinthians, he addressed a bunch of different issues. You know how you get an email from somebody and they're like, hey, here's the thing, blah, great talking to you, bye. Right? And you're like, clearly, we only had one thing to discuss, we hit it, and we're good. Well, St. Paul had like seven big issues that he hit. It would have been a bullet-pointed email, right? All right. It, it was a, there was a lot of things going on. 
And one of those things was that there were Christians in the church at Corinth who essentially said, I speak in tongues or I prophesy, therefore I'm better than you who do, who do not. All right? If you don't, and I do, I'm better than you are. Ha. All right? Now, this isn't normally talked about in this context, but I want you to follow with me here a couple points. All right? I'm going to start off in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And in verse 1, he says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through every verse of the chapter. But he says, look, bullet point 4. Now concerning the gifts of the Spirit. Let's talk. And then he says, a little bit later on, he goes through the whole list of all the gifts of the Spirit. He says, but the same one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as God wills. Right? It doesn't say everybody gets every gift. And then we have a passage starting in verse 12, that talks about the body of Christ and unity and diversity, right? And what he says, cutting it short, is he says, look, we're all part of the same body, but the hand can't look down on the foot because it's not a hand. We have to have feet or we wouldn't be able to walk. We have to have eyes or we wouldn't be able to see. The hand can't fuss at the eye because it doesn't grip, right? Now, obviously, this has lots of implications and lots of, of uh, ways that it applies to the church today. But the way he was talking about it back then was if you have the gift of tongues, you can't look down on somebody who does not. You can't look down on somebody who has healing or just faith, which is another gift of the Spirit, right? Right? He's saying, look, in fact, the body parts that we have that are not quite as public, we actually accord more glory and more modesty. We take care of those parts, right? And he says, there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all members rejoice with it. Right? Now, he's talking in this context, he's talking about people who think that they're better than other Christians because of whatever spiritual gift they have, be it prophecy or be it speaking in tongues. Right? He's saying you can't, God forbid, that a member of the church feel like they're being brought down because they don't have the same gift that somebody else does. Right? He says, earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I'll show you a more excellent way. We're going to talk about that next week. But as we move on to chapter 14, he talks more about tongues and prophecies, and he says, look, somebody who speaks in tongues edifies himself. Right? If you give a word in tongue, unless there's an interpretation, Nobody's like, wow, I feel really encouraged about that, right? When Miss Ann gave a word just a few minutes ago, until someone gave the, until Carla gave the interpretation of that word, we were just like, okay. Now, once she gave the, the interpretation of that, it was like, wow, wow, that's a good word. All right. And we can all be encouraged by it, right? That's why St. Paul tells us that tongues must be interpreted. Right In uh, chapter 14, he says, If I come to you speaking with tongues, what profit? What shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by teaching? Right? Even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in sound, how will it be known what's piped or played? He says, Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of a language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Even so, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be, and this is really important, let it be for the edification of the church, the building up, right? The encouragement, the strengthening, right? 
Therefore, let him who prays in a tongue, speaks in a tongue, pray that he may interpret. All right? Now, this is really important. Now, you have to realize that that kind of example of, we would call it a gift of the Spirit, but others in different religions would call it an ecstatic utterance. And it wasn't uncommon in Greece. In fact, if any of you have studied Greek myths, you might have heard of somebody called the Oracle of Delphi, right? And at the Oracle of Delphi, there were uh, various women, virgins, something like nuns, who basically stood over a crack in the ground, and as these noxious, poisonous vapors rose up, they would inhale them and basically have a seizure. And there was a priest there who turned and said, this is what she said. Okay, what she said was she was having a seizure, but that's beside the point. And so when Christians did the same thing, they were like, oh, we get that. It's like, well, not exactly. Because that's one of the reasons why St. Paul says, this is a gift from, the, from God. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's not like what these others are doing, right? And on top of that, one of the things that was also important is St. Paul says the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Now, when these ladies in Delphi would huff these poisonous fumes, they would lose control of themselves. Again, seizure. But people had the idea that you could just do things when motivated by these spirits and that they weren't in control of themselves. And to be clear about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, nobody loses control. Nobody is taken over to where that they cannot refrain from doing something, right? Because God doesn't reach down and possess someone and go, okay, say this now. It's not how it works. The spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. That means they can refrain. They can hold themselves back. Because it's very important to realize that God is a God of order. He's a God of justice. If we look at Genesis 1, we see this swirling mass of nothingness, this chaos, and God immediately starts saying, okay, this goes here, this goes here, this goes here. And on, the, on days, what is four through seven, he says, okay, I've made these things, now I'm going to put these things in them. I've made the sky, I'm going to put the stars in it. I've made the sea, I'm going to put the fish in it. I've made the land, I'll bring animals and trees and bushes and all sorts of green things, and then I'm going to make man. Because God put things in order. God is not a God of chaos. He's a God of order. Right? He doesn't want us to be in a place of confusion or chaos and this is why he warns about tongues and says, look, therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there come those who are uninformed or unbelievers, they will say you're out of your mind. Been there before. Right? When something happens in a church service and everyone's like, you guys are nuts. Right? That's not what God wants, because God is God of order. And when everyone is giving a word or prophesying, and that is not order. So St. Paul says, and I'm in verse 26, How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. Again, Vocabulary word of the day. Edification, building up, strengthening, encouraging. If there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church 
and let him speak to God, let him speak to himself and to God. All right, so this is one of those things. Thank God we have people who have the gift of interpretation so that when somebody gives a word, there's somebody to interpret it. St. Paul says, look, if you don't have somebody who has that gift of interpretation, don't give a word because it brings confusion, right? And then he says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. If anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. For you all can prophesy one by one that all may learn and be encouraged. Again, the spirit of the, subjects, or the, spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches. So we have this incredible gift that's been poured out upon us by the Holy Spirit. And that gift is such that by the grace of the Holy Spirit, God gives us an ability to communicate with him, to speak in the tongues of angels, right? Some people are given those gifts, just as some people are given the gifts of healing. But going back to, going back to this unfortunate mistake that we had in previous generations, St. Paul asks, God has appointed these in the church. He says, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles and gifts of healing, helps, administrations, and varieties of tongues. And then he says, are all apostles? Clearly not. Are all prophets? Also, clearly not. Are all teachers? Clearly not. Are all workers of miracles? Well, of course not. Do all have gifts of healing? No. Do all speak with tongues? No. No. Not all do. He says, but earnestly desire the best gifts. So, we all have been given spiritual gifts, but we all have not been given the same gifts. Right? Some have discernment. Some have words of wisdom and words of knowledge. Some have more faith than others. Some are able to interpret tongues. Some are able to, to speak in tongues. If you are one who does not speak in tongues, and you've asked to do so, God has something else for you. Thanks be to God. We do not all walk the same path, but we all have the same destination. And that is the cross, where we die to self and become more like Jesus. God forbid we should ever condemn a brother or sister in Christ because they don't have the same gifts that we do. Because that is the height of vanity, because we imply or even state that we're better than somebody else because God is using them differently. He may be using them better. That's right. And as we come together, we have to realize that these gifts, once again, are not so we can check off boxes in our spiritual toolbox. They're not so that we can get puffed up and be like, I gave a prophecy today. Woo me! Look, that is God working through you. When we uh, go to the kitchen and get a glass of water, we're like, oh, that's so refreshing. Thank God for those pipes. <laughs> now, we, we probably ought to, because if something goes wrong with your pipes, you don't really get water. But any pipe will do, right? It's the water that we're grateful for, right? In this metaphor, the water is the Holy Spirit, right? He can move through me. He can move through anyone. If he can move through me, he can certainly move through anybody else. But we should not be in a place where we look down on others for their gifts because we all have been given gifts. But when we use those gifts together, we need to be mindful that the goal is not building ourselves up, but building the church up. Which means sometimes those things that we would like to do, we back burner for the sake of the good of everyone. Right? Sometimes we feel like there's something that we need to say. Sometimes we feel this burning with us and we're like, oh, I just got to say it. Yeah, that's, 
That's not always what God's calling us to do. Sometimes it is. But sometimes, if everybody got that feeling and everybody acted on those feelings, we would have sheer pandemonium. And if there were a, a, somebody who had come in off the street, somebody who hadn't been a Christian before, and everybody acted like that, they would get out of here so fast, and we would never see them again. They'd change their phone number, they'd cancel their social media, we wouldn't be able to contact them at all. But God is a God of order, and he calls us to submit to that order. And he calls us to be mindful that these gifts are for the building up of each other, not just ourselves. It's not so that we can feel good about ourselves. It's so the church can be strengthened. It's so that other people can be blessed by what God is doing, so that we can be conduits of God's grace. Not just, you know, give ourselves a little gold star and be like, yay me. It is an amazing, amazing miracle that God moves through us. That when we go out into the world, when we gather together, that he gives us grace and gives us the gifts of the Spirit so that we can grow in the knowledge and love of him, so that we can bear the fruit of the Spirit, so that we can have those joy, peace, gentleness, self-control, all those things acting in our lives. We have to be mindful of what the cause of those things is and what the goal of those gifts are. If we're building each other up. We have to be mindful when we exercise our gifts as a hand or as an eye or as a foot or as any other body part. We have to be mindful that the goal is not to bring chaos and confusion. It's not so that we can do crazy outlandish things. The goal is building up the church, both inside, here within these walls, and bringing others in. And that's why sometimes we say, hey, now is not the time for this. And it's why other times we're like, oh yeah, let's go. Because God is moving. He moves in our lives today, as he's moved in the lives of the church throughout all ages. And so what we are called to do is to recognize, one, the diversity of gifts that exist in this community and abroad, except that somebody else's gifts are different than ours. And we need to rejoice that we are a body that has different members who do different things for the good of the body. If the eye says, hey, that looks good, let's go over there, and the feet say, nope, we're going over that way. Neither one is satisfied. The body works together. The body works together to grow and be strengthened. And sometimes that's hard. If you ever started working out, you do a really good workout, the next day you feel terrible. Don't let anybody lie to you. Right? But that's how we get stronger. Sometimes we have to deal with this awkwardness. Sometimes we have to deal with this strangeness. But this is how we grow together, and it's also how we expand the kingdom of God. And this is what we're called to do. We want to see God's will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And God wants all to be saved. He desires not the death of sinners, but each should turn and embrace him. And so as we move forward, as we go forward, as the word and the interpretation told us today, as we move forward, we have to move forward in the knowledge and love of Christ. We have to move forward empowered by the fact that there's a diversity of gifts in this congregation. But the body is united and moves together for the building up of the church of God. May we do so by the gift of the Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.